episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Uh, welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another truly fascinating guest uh, helping to create a better tomorrow uh, on many different fronts. Uh, as a little background, um, the theme of synthetic biology uh, is one we've touched on a couple times in the past. Uh, as review, it's a, a very multidisciplinary area of research that ultimately uh, seeks to create either new biologic parts, devices, systems, or redesign current systems that are already found in nature. Uh, it is a branch of science that encompasses a, a quite broad range of uh, methodologies from different disciplines, including biotech, genetic engineering, systems biology, uh, on the way down through electrical and computer engineering, uh, control theory, and evolutionary biology. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined by Dr. Ron Weiss, uh, who's a professor at biological engineering at MIT. And Professor Weiss is one of the pioneers of the area of synthetic biology, and he's been engaged in this domain of research uh, since back in 1996, uh, when he was a graduate student at MIT, uh, when, where he helped set up uh, the first wet lab in the electrical engineering and computer science department. Uh, after completion of his PhD, Dr. Weiss joined the faculty at Princeton University, uh, and then recently returned to MIT to take on a tenured faculty position in the Department of Biological Engineering and the Department of Electrical engineering computer science. And there are a, a range of fascinating programs going on uh, in Dr. Weiss's lab, uh, such as the construction of synthetic gene networks to uh, further improve our understanding of the naturally existing regulatory functions that exist within cells, uh, and which may have a wide range of uh, very interesting programming opportunities in terms of micro uh, biorobotic communication in vivo biosensors, a lot of really exciting stuff. So with that, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Dr. Ron Weiss to the show. Thank you. Pleasure uh, to be here. Pleasure to get to interact with you. It's a, it is a real pleasure on our part. Um, you know, I uh, typically I start off the show by handing uh, our guests the floor for a little bit just to, to further introduce themselves. Um, uh, you know, if you could just uh, take us back a little bit to sort of the beginning, everything from sort of where you grew up, how you got interested in these sort of two domains of uh, both the computer engineering and the bioengineering. And then uh, as a sort of a second part of that, um, you know, in going through uh, your uh, publications, um, you know, everything sort of in the early 1990s had, had nothing to do with this uh, oh. space of synthetic biology, but, you know, uh, things like search engines and content routing. So talk a little bit about how you made yeah. that transition yeah. as well. Yeah, so as a young kid, actually, if you're going all the way back there, I've always been interested in programming. And that's something that, you know, I was back in the day, you know, this is about four decades ago or more, you know, I was programming even with, punch cards and programming these mainframes. And then I remember, you know, my dad bought a computer, little four bit computer for me when I was uh, about eight or nine. And I just thought it was just unbelievably fascinating. So, so I've always had the programming bug in my head and I've always, you know, just thought like my desire was, you know, can I program this to do, you know, just new functions and new capabilities. Um, and, and I've always found that incredibly satisfying. And so not surprisingly, you know, once I uh, went to college, I became, uh, you know, computer science major. And so I was at uh, near Boston, at uh, Brandeis University, which is right outside of Boston. And I was, you know, uh, I was actually also an economics major, but I, uh, I did that for fun. I like, you know, I liked uh, marginal demand and marginal cost and understanding this curve. So from a computer science nerdy kind of perspective, I, it was a lot of fun, but my passion has always been in the programming. And, you know, I, and I got my uh, bachelor's degree in computer science, and then uh, I came to MIT to pursue a PhD, and this is still in computer science uh, back in 1992. And I started working on various things related to quote unquote normal computer science. So uh, I worked for my master's on something called a digital video, which the notion was, how can we think about video as a searchable data data element? I was actually even actually going going back to even my bachelor's. I was working on 
something called the organization engine. And the idea there is how do we organize data and how are we able to search data locally? And I remember one of the, uh, in my background chapter, uh, one of the things I was comparing my work to was this thing that not many, many people knew about called the World Wide Web. <laughs> and and, then it, and I wrote, well, you know, this World Wide Web is interesting, but it can't do this and it can't do that. So it's not gonna go very far. And so, and my, you know, my organization engine is much better because it can do X, Y, and Z. So that prediction didn't pan out all too well, uh, shockingly. But, you know, but I was, I've always, you know, been interested in also, you know, in programming, but also things like uh, distributed systems. Um, and one of the things I got into was, you know, you mentioned like these search engines, distributed search engines, um, and, and the networking, the fact that you have all of these elements in a network, in a computer network that interact with one another. So that's, I've always just been fascinated in how uh, you can get many elements to interact and have coherent behavior. And about halfway through my PhD, so I was working on these distributed information retrieval um, systems, a, um, a different uh, professor at MIT, just, you know, I've always talked to him and uh, Jerry Sussman, and I was walking down the hall and he said, Ron, come into my office. I'm working on this white paper on this new idea. And the new idea was, what if we can embed computing in everything? Like what, what can we, you know, if we can embed computing in, you know, dust mm. or paint, right? And so you may have heard about smart dust, smart paint. And so I was like, wow, this is such a cool idea. And I said, you know, so I, I switched over to his lab and I started thinking about, you know, how could we program, you know, thousands, you know, millions of little computing elements, right? That would be all over, you know, the environment. Um, and, you know, and so we were focused in this project called amorphous computing mm -hmm. on building, you know, the prototypes, but also thinking about high level abstraction. How could, you know, what are, what's the programming language for thinking about programming millions of tiny little elements? And I was thinking, you know, what, I need some inspiration for that. And I basically looked at it. I said, well, biology is kind of an obvious place where you get robust programming, reliable, you know, reproducible ways by which, you know, millions and more of little computational elements that are not very reliable individually, but when they come together, they, you know, they create these, you know, really robust systems. And so biology seemed like a good place for me to get inspired on how to uh, program these amorphous computers. And indeed I started doing simulations of biological systems. So I was doing simulations of embryogenesis. So how does an embryo actually form? You know, because it's just absolutely fascinating to think about you know, developmental biology. So you get one cell that divides and divides and divides and somehow magically is able to form uh, you know, these gradients and these structures and uh, that end up forming your, you know, different body segments and ultimately, you know, an actual human being. It's an absolutely fascinating as, um, notion. And so I was beginning to program, you know, uh, to program uh, in the computer, these biological systems and thinking to myself, how would I as a computer programmer create, for example, uh, different neuronal segments in a developing embryo, All right? So that's one of the first things that happens in, you know, developmental biology and embryogenesis yeah. is the formation of these somites, which are different neuronal, you know, segments and uh, also different segments that end up, you know, shaping, you know, the, uh, various parts of your body, you know, legs, you know, stomach, uh, you know, so on. Um, and I remember... So at the time, I actually had Jerry Sussman, I had Al Abelson and also Tom Knight were kind of co-advisors, co-PhD advisors. And, um, you know, and they be, you know, began to think about this notion of uh, being able to program cells with logic elements. And I, so I remember the day where I said to myself, that's where I want to do. I basically want to flip the arrow 
so that rather than uh, be inspired by biology on how to program computers, how can I take what I know, com you know, computers and actually program biology? And so I said, this is absolutely fascinating. This is something I have to do and possibly for the rest of my life. Um, and then, so I began to work more closely with Tom Knight and I helped him set up a wet lab in uh, the AI lab at MIT, the artificial intelligence lab at MIT. And we began to basically teach ourselves on how to, you know, genetically engineered cells, genetically engineered cells so that we can program the cells to do digital logic, to do, you know, computation, biological computation though, not, not with electronics and not with voltages, but with proteins. And so, uh, so my PhD ended up, half of it ended up being about how to genetically engineer uh, bacterial cells so that they can do operations like, you know, and not, or, you know, those types of operations, logic gate operations. And the other half of my PhD was how do you get these individual cells to then coordinate behavior via cell-cell communication. So how do you get a bacteria to synthesize and secrete small molecules, which would then diffuse from the sending bacteria into the receiver bacteria, and the receiver bacteria would light up and would make a, a fluorescent protein that you can look under a microscope and say, oh, there's actually cell-cell communication uh, going on between them. You can, you can basically see the gradients of communication as the cells light up from the sender cells to the receiver cells. And so that, you know, so that's basically how um, I got into this notion of synthetic biology as, you know, through my desire to want to program cells. Outstanding. Yeah, I, uh, I, I checked out the, uh, the paper on amorphous computing. Uh, and I recommend everyone listening and watching. It's uh, from 2000. It's, it's really cool and fascinating. Everything from, uh, you know, paints that can sense intruders and, and wind load on different structures. Really, really cool. And uh, I, I see the, the, the ultimate connection, sort of that paper being sort of the bridge between the computer and the biology world as you were moving along. Uh, um, but after that, I, you know, I, I want to um, go from 2000 to 2009, uh, yeah. where you write an equally uh, fascinating paper. Uh, it was in Nature Reviews, like your cell biology, entitled The Second Wave of Synthetic Biology from Modules to Systems. And you yeah. talk about this transition that's, uh, that needs to occur in the sense that in the first wave of synthetic biology, you were understanding the transcriptional and the translational dynamics and different cellular processes. But you know, you uh, think in systems. You think in these very complex uh, gene regulatory networks. When you're talking about things like embryogenesis, that's not a, this gene or that protein. It's these really complex networks, and we need to understand those uh, and and be able to work with those that complexity to make really cool stuff happen. Talk a little bit about this this second wave uh, yeah. as you see it. Yeah, and so it kind of looking back at uh, what we've seen evolve and emerge in synthetic biology, one way to think about different phases is that the initial phase was this notion of building, you know, the basic modules, okay? And so uh, there are important papers. So uh, Jim Collins uh, had a paper on building a toggle switch, an on-off toggle switch. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Elowitz uh, and Stan Leibler had another paper which really was seminal which was to build an oscillator. So a gene expression network that goes up and down automatically. And I was uh, at the time working on building these basic logic devices and also the engineered cell-cell communication. Uh, and this was all uh, around the year 2000. And so I kind of was looking at the first phase as this notion of how do we demonstrate non-trivial behavior, you know, program behavior in cells oscillators, toggle switches, basic logic operation, and engineered cell-cell communication. And so that's the modules. And so, you know, um, and arguably that was kind of the first five, six, seven years of synthetic biology. 
And then uh, once the field, you know, us in the field have been able to demonstrate these basic capabilities, we began to think of a building system out of module, right? So that's kind of the normal progression in many engineering uh, disciplines is you begin with devices and then you build modules and then you build systems. And so we began to think about in the field of how do we take these basic modules and begin to connect them? So can we connect, you know, for example, uh, a logic circuit that can do and or not operations so that it would control a toggle switch? And it can, you can, can you have a toggle switch that controls whether cells are communicating with one another, right? And so, um, you know, so these, these kinds of mechanisms where we said, okay, we, we think we can now build a set of you know, basic device, uh, sorry, basic modules. And then what, what, what happens as we begin to, to put them together, what kind of more sophisticated behavior can we actually achieve? And so that, that I would say was the, the transition from the, from the first phase to kind of the second wave of synthetic biology. Uh, I would say that uh, following that, you know, we, we then transitioned into this notion that, you know, by the way, uh, the, the focus there was a lot of it was how do we turn uh, fluorescent proteins on and off mm -hmm. in bacterial cells, right? So, and it's a lot of fun to make, you know, uh, blinking bacteria, uh, you know, it's really, uh, or bacteria that all of a sudden can make uh, all kinds of patterns in a Petri dish. So we had a paper in 2005 showing that uh, we can genetically engineer bacteria to send these uh, molecules and create chemical gradients. And then the cells can detect the chemical gradients and based on the actual concentrations, decide what fluorescent proteins to make. And so we're able to create all kinds of patterns in a Petri dish, uh, like bullseye patterns and other kinds of flowery patterns and things like that. Um, which, which made us very happy. Um, but then what happened, you know, starting, you know, roughly around uh, 2010, maybe a little bit before, maybe a little bit after, is really begin to think about how to take what we've been able to demonstrate and begin to think about applications. And so begin to think about not just wanting to have blinking bacteria, which again is, is very interesting, but also what kinds of applications could we envision if we can genetically engineer cells? You know, what kind of uh, medical applications, what kind of environmental applications, agricultural applications, uh, biomanufacturing applications and so on. So I, I would say that following the uh, modules to systems, it was systems to applications mm -hmm. and, and and if you look right now, you know, it's uh, what's going on. There's been like, you know, this kind of amazing expansion from uh, working uh, in synthetic biology and bacterial system to expanding uh, synthetic biology to kind of any almost form of life, you know, mm -hmm. uh, moving to yeast, moving to mammalian cells uh, and plants, and then beginning to really think about how these systems could actually be used to improve, you know, the human situation. How, how can we, you know, harness biology to make, you know, the world a better place? Essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, along those lines, um, you know, an extremely hot area in, in developmental biology and, and disease and drug screening, personalized medicine is, of course, this area of organoid development uh, or these miniaturized sort of simplified versions of organs, although fairly complex in their anatomy. Um, you, you have a, a, a really recent paper in Nature Materials uh, entitled Rethinking Organoid Technology Through Bioengineering. And here again, you bring up this, um, this concept that you know, when we're dealing with things like self-organization uh, of something like an organoid where you know, this is not just one cell, it has 
Uh, it's a mixture of cells. It has form and a straight polarity. And, it, it, you know, once you get into three dimensions of size and shape and, and so forth, things get a lot more complex. Yeah. Uh, and, and here you have these diffusible, uh, you know, components of so cell X that tells cell Y what to do and what to become and, and on and on. Um, talk a little bit about now as, we, as we're moving now from systems to these uh, translational opportunities. Talk a little bit about what you're doing in organoid technology. Uh, it, it, obviously, nothing confidential. I, I, I also saw that you were involved in the uh, the Welcome Leap program with the kidney yep. stuff, which is really cool. Uh, whatever you can talk about, please. Uh, it really sounds cool. Yeah, yeah, happy to. So, so my you know fascination with this notion of being able to uh, program tissues, and you know now it's called organoid. Actually, you know, dates back to a quarter cent, uh, quarter century ago, when you know it stemmed a lot of it from the fact that I was beginning to simulate developmental processes, mm -hmm. you know, a quarter century ago, and I saw that you know I was like, and, and it kind of coupled nicely with my interest in multi, you know, multi-element uh, networks, and you know, I think that there's a really nice correlation between multicellularity and computer networks. Right? In actuality, and so um, you know, after I did these uh, patterns in the computer, I you know, I kind of then said, I let me go to the basics. Let me understand how to uh, genetically engineer basic capabilities in the cells, uh, genetically engineer cell cell communication, and begin to think about you know how to build from the ground up these capabilities that we can ultimately program the kinds of shapes and structures and three dimensionalities that we might want. And so uh, we worked for a while on bacterial pattern formation. And then 2005, we began to, uh, I, I said, okay, we've kind of learned enough so that I can start feeling comfortable about going from bacterial synthetic biology to mammalian synthetic biology and be able to really think about not just forming patterns with bacteria, but what if I can form patterns with mammalian cells? And, and ultimately, this notion of if I can uh, genetically program stem cells mm -hmm. to create three-dimensional patterns by design, you know, I imagine that could be useful. You know, that may be helpful in terms of being able to create organoids that we might be able to use for, you know, healing wounds or, or tissue regeneration and things like that. And so... You know, so got very fascinated, you know, by the notion of, you know, can we really program these stem cells? And we started working on a variety of different, again, basic mechanisms that would allow us to engineer stem cells to become the specific cell types that we want in order for them to be then useful in, you know, helping people with tissue regeneration, being able to transplant these, you know, uh, lab developed organoids so that if you have a failing liver, you know, or something like that, can we actually develop, you know, a liver in the lab and actually transplant that uh, into a patient? And so what we started with is this notion, we asked ourselves, what would we want to do with stem cells? And we said, you know, could we imagine genetically programming stem cells to create insulin producing pancreatic beta cells? And so you can imagine, you know, you know, there's a lot of interest in the world right now in being able to do that uh, in terms of being able to help uh, people with diabetes. Sure. Right? So the notion that, you know, we'll take uh, stem cells and then uh, somehow transform them to beta cells and then put them uh, into, you know, the pancreas of a diabetic patient, maybe, you know, maybe that could actually help with, you know, insulin produ you know, production. Um, and so we, you know, and, and it's hard to make beta cells. Sure. It's not, you can't just say, I'm going to give this special molecule and the stem cell is going to become a beta cell. It just doesn't work like that. And so there, you know, there really is an appreciation in the community of the complexity, you know, of beta cells among other cell types that there really needs to be uh, a sophisticated way to take stem cells. And, and the notion is take these stem cells and give them timely instructions to mimic what actually happens in normal development. So have the stem cells. So the, the notion is 
um, and there are people, you know, of great labs around the world. There's one, Doug Melton uh, at Harvard, is one of the worldwide leaders. And, and so this notion of, you know, tell the stem cells to first become, you know, endoderm. You know, and that's, that's the first thing. And then from endoderm, you know, to pancreatic progenitors. And from pancreatic progenitors to, you know, you know, all the stages along the way, you know, to endocrine, to islet cells, and ultimately, you know, to, to well-functioning beta cell, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that there actually in biology, there's a developmental program. Sure. That goes from stem cells to beta cells. And we asked the question, you know, could we imagine creating a synthetic biology program that would automatically guide the cells so that they go from stem cells to, you know, endoderm. Mm -hmm. And then they would sense, oh, it's, you know, I'm an endoderm now. It's time to activate <laughs> you know, phase two. And I'm a pancreatic progenitor. Time to activate phase three, you know, and so on and so on. So it'd be like a multi-step automatic uh, program to go to basically recapitulate biology. And so yeah. this is, you know, 2006. And we said, all right, let's start with step one, mm -hmm. which is going, let's go from stem cells to endoderm. Now, I do want to also mention, so at the time, this notion of induced pluripotency stem cells was just beginning to surface. We were yep. still thinking about it in, in terms of just real, you know, kind of stem cells. But this amazing discovery happened, um, you know, Yamanaka, and, mm -hmm. uh, that you can actually take skin cell, you know, fibroblast skin cells, and then, you know, genetically reprogram them to create these induced pluripotency stem cells. And that has completely revolutionized, uh, you know, developmental biology, biology in general. And so this notion that you can take from an individual skin and reprogram it to become induced pluripotency stem cell and then generate cells, you know, of a specific kind, you know, beta cells or whatever, and then put it back into your body, that's your own genetically identical cells. And, and your bod, body hopefully won't reject that. It yes. will think this is just me. And so that, you know, that's such an exciting notion. And we said, all right. And so we, you know, we were starting to work on this beta cell uh, program. And we took step one, uh, you know, genetically program stem cells to endoderm, which was not known at the time. And uh, this was a long, long-term project. I actually started when I was in Princeton and we continued that uh, at MIT. And I uh, was really led by a former postdoc in the lab, Patrick Gee. And he was able to show that we can drive uh, stem cell or IPS to uh, endoderm. And it was actually working very well, very reliable and so we're really excited about that. And at that point, I told them, Patrick, that's awesome. You got stage one to work after about, you know, eight years. And I was like, all right, let's work on stage two. <laughs> and, and luckily, he didn't really listen to me. And he was really curious to see. So, okay, so if you can drive the cells st to stage one, what, what is biology going to do? You know, uh, what, what's going to happen to the cell mm -hmm. after you do that? And so it turns out that we weren't just getting endoderm. We actually were getting mesoderm as well. Okay. Okay. So we're getting endoderm, mesoderm, and we're getting some ectoderm too. So, you know, when those are the three germ layers, right? So when you go from stem cells, you get endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm, and those lead to the formation of every cell type, every tissue in your body. So we actually were able to get that in a Petri dish. And then Patrick was asking the question, what happened? How does this continue to develop? And so it's really interesting that the endoderm developed into hepatic lineages. Mm. Uh, so it actually became liver-like. Mm -hmm. And the mesoderm ended up developing into vasculature and hematopoietic Ooh. progenitors, all you know, blood cells and vasculature and immune cells and things like that. And so if we wait long enough, this system actually develops a vascularized liver organoid mm. that is, you know, is patient 
specific vascularized liver organism. And so, and, and this, and we are still working on this vascularized liver organ, but it's not, you know, it, at the time it was, you know, it's actually really cool because it is, it, the sphere that grows and grows and grows and you can, it gets quite large mm -hmm. in terms of organoids. It was actually getting to the point, if you grew them for two and a half months, it was centimeters. Mm. So it's, you know, it's really larger than any other organoid out there. Uh, you know, especially, you know, at the time for sure. And we think part of that is because it had the, all this vasculature mm -hmm. in it. And so we're getting these really big liver organoid structures. And so we got super excited about that, you know, published on that. And we said, you know, let's really understand the liver organoid. Let's really understand what's going on there and understand how mature is this? Is it, you know, is this like, an, a, you know, we weren't expecting it to be like an adult liver. Right. Right. But is it, you know, how mature is it? Uh, so you can look at things like, you know, how much albumin is it making? How much urea is it making? So there's a whole bunch of assays that you do to figure out maturation. And it turns out that under, uh, for certain properties, it's quite mature. And for other properties, it was still a little bit fetal. And so what we've been able to do recently is actually create a mechanism so that it's now able to take stage two. So it's actually able to say, okay, now, you know, I've reached these hepatic stage. Let me actually activate all kinds of genetic programs only in, hep in the hepatocytes that actually cause them and only them to mature. Hmm. And so, so the cool thing here is that we now have the genetic ability to have this complex organoid develop and then be able to guide through this uh, multi-step differentiation program, guide further differentiation of the different types within that developing organoid. So we can, so we can say the hepatocytes, you guys get your specific instruction on how to further mature. Mm -hmm. Vasculature, you get your own instruction. Immune cells, blood cells, you know, you get your own instruction. So, so then within this complex multicellular assembly, we now have the ability to drive uh, the, you know, the, or control the behavior of cells based on their identity within this developing organism. So, so now... Yeah, I, I'm just uh, just thinking about the vascularization alone because that's uh, I've done a few shows in the past on uh, sort of recell, decell technologies on extracellular matrices, things like that. And yeah, I mean the vascularization has always been sort of the the big the big issue for those people. That, I mean, you got no blood supply here. And, yeah, <laughs> and exactly. Yeah. And so, so the cool thing is that we're getting an organoid where the vasculature code develops. And it's fully integrated within, you know, the rest of the or, of the hepatocytes, the rest of the organism. So, so we, so from, you know, my belief is that, you know, if we, you know, this is the way that we really want to engineer organoids mm -hmm. is by being able to control the code development of all the necessary cell types, you know, in much the same way that you know, happens in a real, in real embryogenesis, right? Mm -hmm. In real embryogenesis, mm -hmm. you don't have just these cells, you know, you know, endothelial cells just develop here and hepatocytes develop there. And then they develop separately. And at some point, you know, they get put together. That's not how it works. Everything right. goes out. And there's a lot of intercellular interactions. And, you know, there's very complex interactions, movement, motility, you know, biomechanics, uh, you know, morphogen gradients. So all of these factors mm -hmm. together to create, you know, the, the tissues and, and the, and the or, you know, the organs and the, and the organ system and so on. And so, so I think that uh, the ability to use synthetic biology to put instructions in there is, you know, really transforms and changes the paradigm of how we are able to uh, control the development of these organisms, including getting vasculature 
to co-develop. So one of the things, for example, we're working on right now, you know, and this goes back to our, you know, interest with pancreas mm -hmm. is, you know, now that we can get uh, these stems, this iPSCs to endoderm and mesoderm, the idea is let's now drive the endoderm rather than to liver, let's try to drive it towards pancreas. Mm. Because pancreas is actually, you know, is kind of a neighbor of liver during yep. development and actually is derived also from endoderm. So the idea is that when the cells become endoderm, then tell those cells how to guide them towards pancreatic rather than hepatic state. But then you want the mesoderm to continue to develop so that we, you know, you get vascularized pancreas. Right. So that that's the goal there. Really cool. Really fascinating. And so and so in terms of applications, why you know, why is this useful? So it's useful at least in two ways. There, mm -hmm. there are more ways, but uh, two ways that we're working on right now. One of them is uh, can we use this for uh, drug development? So for example, you know, it would be nice if we could test drugs on organs in a Petri dish mm -hmm. that are as similar as possible to my liver or, yep. you know, or my kidney or my pancreas or you know, my brain, right? And so, so in the, and this is a big push right now um, you know, in research in general, but also, you know, in with pharmaceutical companies, is can we use much better models for drug development? Because you know, when we do experiments either in cell culture or we do experiments with animals, mm -hmm. how well does that recapitulate what the drug is going to do? Yep. And oftentimes that fails miserably. Uh, and so the notion of being able to replace or augment those assays with human derived tissue uh, could lead to you know, a significant improvements in our prediction capabilities and also perhaps even personalized medicine. So maybe, you know, maybe I should know what would happen to my liver in a Petri dish mm -hmm. if, you know, if there are specific molecule, you know, drugs that, you know, I'm taking myself you know, maybe I can figure out what would happen to my liver uh, under these combinations of 20 different drugs, which, mm -hmm. you know, people take combinations of drugs all the time. And it's, yep. not, it's not always clear what, what actually would happen. So, so I think in terms of drug development, uh, this is something that's happening right now in terms of trying to augment or replace the way we do, you know, pharmaceuticals test drugs right now. Uh, with with human, you know, derived organisms. The other thing is, you know, and that alludes back to, you know, the original goals also was, uh, can we create a liver in a petri dish, which would be your genetically identical liver, and then put that, you know, if you have liver failure, you know, if you're, you know, fibrotic liver or something like that, or or you have NASH or any kind of liver disease, mm -hmm. can we take your skin cells, reprogram them to stem cells, and then in a petri dish create your own, you know, mini liver that we can put back into. And then, you know, ultimately, can we even help that liver that was made in a Petri dish to better engraft, better vascularize with, with your own system, mm -hmm. better proliferate, better, you know, we may maintain viability. And ultimately, could we even, you know, improve certain properties of that liver? You know, can, can we have better metabolism embedded in that liver? Can we make that liver uh, be more resistant to, you know, to certain viruses, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think there's some, some really fascinating opportunities there, ones that we can imagine now and ones that we, we can't even imagine right now in terms of, you know, being able to genetically program these and, and help people, you know, in need. And that's a, uh, that's a huge space in terms of organ transplantation alone. Uh, putting yeah. aside the, the, the drug screening, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's ridiculously large. So, yeah, I mean, that's uh, extremely fascinating. 
Um, you know, I, I wanted to, I mean, thank you for that, that comprehensive overview. I, I, that, that's, that's awesome stuff. I, I wanted to um, also ask you, while I had you about uh, the, the work you're doing in the, uh, the biosensing, because um, obviously uh, you read about in vivo biosensors, but then also um, read some stuff in your materials about, uh, you know, not just sort of stuff that you could design for health, the humans, but uh, for things like environmental biosensing, uh, you know, if there's a toxin, uh, could you engineer a, you know, a plant to, to, yeah. to change color and all that bit? Uh, talk a little bit about that, if you would. Yeah, and so, yeah, biosensing, uh, I mean, I think has uh, applications in medical and non-medical applications. But mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the medical applications that we have in, in mind and are working on right now, they include things like uh, genetically engineering uh, viruses that would actually be able to infect tumor cells and decide, you know, based on biosensing, mm. is this really a tumor cell or is this a healthy cell? Got it. And then if it's a if it's a tumor cell, then kill it and also create inflammation in the body. And if it's a healthy cell, just leave it alone. So mm. we would have, you know, based on the biosensing this very targeted mechanism that would be able to distinguish between tumor and non-tumor cells and actually, you know, help, you know, eradicate tumors. And so I think that's, you know, that's one application of biosensing that, you know, would have some really nice, you know, medical applications. And you can imagine uh, extending that to many other kinds of uh, medically relevant, you know, diseases and, you know, are you misregulating this, you know, hormones, or are you misregulating, you know, cytokine levels in your body? So, for example, you know, if you're infected with a virus and it, you have a cytokine release storm, where your body goes into hyperinflammation of your mm -hmm. lungs, you know, because of you know you got you have COVID, you know, can we come up with ways that would sense that and would be able to actually attenuate and reduce inflammation in the air? So sometimes you want to add inflammation, and sometimes you want to reduce inflammation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so the notion of biosensing, I think, uh, you, you know, within a health-related application could help. Sure. You know, and, but, you know, you raise the other important point is that uh, synthetic biology is not purely just for medical yep. applications and uh, environmental sensing, you know, toxins, you know, arsenic. I mean, there's been various kinds of toxin detection mechanisms that have actually been demonstrated in synthetic biology. So can we... Uh, have you know arsenic detection maybe that uh, would be engineered into you know bacteria or algae or things that you can actually release into the environment that would be able to detect it and then release uh, enzymes that would be able to degrade it or or nucleate you know heavy metals right and you know things that uh, mm -hmm. would be useful in you know a toxic dump environment that you know you'd be able to have yeast or bacterial cells that, that can be um, put into these uh, you know, toxic fills or through pipes or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Be able to actually scavenge heavy metals or scavenge other kinds of, of molecules and, and be able to, you know, to clean up these, these toxic waste dumps. Uh, so, um, you know, and again, this is a situation you know, maybe you can also sense, um, you know, pathogens in the environment or, mm -hmm. or, you know, if you have plants, maybe, you know, you can sense that those, those plants are under stress or being attacked. Uh, or maybe you want to sense that uh, you want to engineer, uh, you, you notice that there's, you know, more of a drought situation. Yep. And so maybe you want to engineer expression of, of genes that would, cause the plants to be more drought resistant, but you wouldn't want to have this on the whole time because the drought resistance would normally, uh, you know, reduce the viability of the plant or reduce mm -hmm. certain features about the plant. And so it's not something you'd want to have continuously on. You want to have a biosensor that, that would tell you now, now is the right time to turn on drought resistance or now is the time to, uh, you know, to turn on ripening genes mm -hmm. right and so so i think um yeah one one can just you know even begin to 
imagine what kind of biosensing would would be helpful. You develop that to keep my bananas from browning as fast as they do. That would be, yeah. <laughs> be a trillion dollar industry right there. Yeah. No, really, really, yeah. There's a, a, you, the uh, the the possibilities are are, are quite broad uh, on that one. Um, you, you know, Ron, if obviously you 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 have a lot of extremely cool papers, but if if, if I was forced to pick one, um, I had to pick one that I thought was the coolest. The, the award uh, goes to the 2016 paper, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Perspectives in Biology, entitled Synthetic Morphogenesis, and specifically the section on synthetic life, uh, where you talk about how synthetic morphogenetic systems could allow us to explore configurations and biologic functions not witnessed in evolution, from prosaic tunable materials to industrial manufacturing applications to fantastical functional forms, such as trees that grow into tree houses. My daughter would love that. Um, that being said, um, a couple of weeks ago, I had uh, uh, Mike Levin from uh, In Your Neighborhood over at Tufts on the show talking about his xenobots uh, and his little synthetic life forms there. Um, take us for a couple of minutes on a little sort of, obviously a lot of this sounds sci-fi, but it's transitioning into science reality. Uh, take us a little bit out on some of, some of these science fiction ideas in terms of what you vision in terms of synthetic life forms, whether it's uh, stuff like uh, tunable organisms that we can send to Mars to terraform for us or other things that we might not have thought about yet that you would like to talk about. Yeah, so, so Mike Levin and I were actually uh, both participants in a National Science Foundation uh, center yep. and uh, called EBICS, which Emergent Behaviors of Integrated Cellular System. And so there are about uh, 30 faculty in there and that, that was uh, headed by Roger Camp. Um, and the, you know, I was a research director for that. And it was basically just a whole bunch of people just fascinated with this notion of, can we you know, genetically program uh, systems, cellular systems to, to create all kinds of uh, interesting multicellular uh, structures and, and you know, things like bio bumps, mm -hmm. right? So can, you know, can we genetically engineer these cells to, uh, you know, talk with one another, co collaborate, co coordinate, and create three-dimensional entities that would then be able to sense the environment, that would be able to process information about the environment, and then maybe move around and, you know, move around. What, so, so some, you know, uh, folks, in, in EBEX were able to create, uh, you know, walkers and swimmers, biobot walkers and biobot swimmers. Uh, uh, Rashid Bashir and Tahir Saif were some of the ones that were able to do that. So they, mm -hmm. they can show these, you know, biobots moving around or biobots that can sense light so that, or, you know, electrical gradients and actually mm -hmm. you know, move to different places. And so, you know, it sounds like science fiction, but in, in actuality, you know, beginning to take some initial steps uh, of how to create biobots that, you know, are actually real. And then, you know, the question is, what could we do with that? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, I, the notion of a tree house uh, uh, or, you know, trees that can sense what's going on, light up, uh, change their structure, uh, be able to, you know, form an actual tree house and then, you know, figure out when maybe, you know, there's stress there or, you know, reconfigure the tree house or if there's damage to the tree house I should be able to regenerate it mm. so you know can we have out you know can we deploy uh, you know genetically engineered systems that, that can generate structures in places that would be very hard to generate structures um, and be able to to you know you, you mentioned terraforming Mars I mean People, you know, discuss that. I mean, mm -hmm. can we terraform Mars so that it has, you know, the right atmosphere for us, but then have it also grow, you know, the, you know, create like the forest for us and create, you know, the, the houses for us and create the factories for us. So can, you know, can we get biological systems to create factories that can generate more materials for us? Uh, so... It's fun to think about. Yeah, <laughs> it's really fun to think about, and I, I and I, it's 
you know, pure science fiction right now, but um, who knows? Yeah. One day, uh, one day it's going to happen. One I, day, I, uh, yeah, we'll be able to harness biological systems to make, to make anything, almost not anything, but lots of things for us. Fascinating future coming. Or even, you know, biological systems go out there and like fetch for us and, and tell us, you know, uh, look for, look for things and bring it back to us. And, you know, and, and survey the landscape and go to places where, where it's hard for us to go. Yep. Yep. Extremophiles. Yep. No, really, really, really cool. Um, Ron, just this one, one last thing while I have you. Typically, I, I give the floor back to our guests at the end of the show just uh, uh, for them to uh, shout out to any. Uh, obviously, you, you met quite a, a few people along the way throughout your work in both electrical engineering, computer science, and now biology. Um, take some time to uh, mention, shout out to any mentors, influencers, uh, your, your lab. Uh, organization that uh, has been really important, influential in, in, in making all this happen alongside with you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly uh, starting up, I would say, you know, back in my PhD, uh, you know, Tom Knight uh, just, I think, really transformed my life in terms of, you know, allowing me to be exposed to some better biology and then, and then helping him set up the lab and having a PhD with him. On synthetic biology, so you know his effect has been, you know, nothing short of life transforming. Uh, and, and in addition to that, you know, Jerry Sussman and Hal Abelson, mm -hmm. my two other PhD advisors, and you know their support in 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 the early going, like you know, really allowing me to you know, a computer scientist to engage in uh, and learn molecular biology on the spot. You know, mm -hmm. I'm always going to be. Uh, thankful for them uh, for enabling and, and also just the amazing fun conversation uh, <laughs> that we that we had just just pure you know uh, Jerry Sutton would just come to my office and you know sit on the couch and just begin to have just fun conversation and, and that was the best um, and then you know I, I then started my PhD and uh, I definitely want to thank Frances Arnold and she was my first, you know, collaborated and when I was, uh, you know, at Caltech and when I was uh, doing, you know, the rounds and, you know, giving job talks and things like that, you know, I gave my talk and then we met uh, shortly after and she said, all right, we got to write a grant together uh, about taking synthetic biology and combining that with directed evolution. Mm. And she ultimately won you know the nobel prize for her work on directed evolution uh and we just had an amazing conversation and i ended up uh teaming up with her and uh you know working on several projects that really combine you know directed evolution synthetic biology and different kinds of capabilities and i also learned a lot from her in terms of how you approach science and 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 you know what what is a good way to to uh to carry out science in, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of a, a structured way mm. they can really achieve your goals. And so, you know, and since then I've just had, you know, so many collaborators along the way, um, you know, so I, it's, it's too many to, uh, you know, to really enumerate. Uh, and also, you know, the amazing people in, in my lab, uh, you know, then I've had the opportunity to interact with the, you know, go back to my first graduate student, you know, Subayu Basu, who's, um, you know, so I, I will just mention him. I don't want to, because I don't want to mention others and leave others out, <laughs> but he was my first graduate student. And, um, and we just, and, you know, the other graduate students that came along were all fantastic too. And it's just been, you know, such a fun ride. And, um, you know, just coming in to the, uh, you know, to the lab and, and talking with the graduate students and talking with the postdocs, you know, and then going home and, and still thinking about it. And, you know, you know, before falling asleep, still thinking about all these great conversations with them. So, and it's just, it's just fun. So just fun. Just that, literally fun. Sounds like an amazingly fun journey. And, you know, 
wishing you the best with all this uh, moving forward. It's, it's really fascinating stuff. And um, for, for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, you've been listening to MIT's Professor Ron Weiss, Professor of Biologic Engineering, uh, riding the no, third wave uh, of synthetic biology, uh, working at the intersection of uh, biological, electrical, and computer engineering. Uh, really fascinating work, Ron. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk with us, uh, thanking you for everything that you're doing for society. And uh, as we say on the show, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow through your work. It's extremely inspirational and exciting to watch you and we're wishing you the best moving it forward. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed Thank you for inviting me for this. I really enjoyed talking with you and uh, I look forward to further interactions. And, and I look through the set of, you know, uh, interviews that you have online. There's just such a, a great collection of topics and people to discuss some amazing things. Thanks so much for that.